Okay, my laptop says I'm recording. It's in progress. So I hope everyone's doing okay. And uh, just to let you know that this week also, I felt by reading the story on the scheduled person, artist, Michelangelo, and your syllabus just wasn't enough. I don't want to give too short of a video. So I'm adding a, an American woman artist that even many American people don't know about. So it will just add to your knowledge and understanding with uh, creative information about her life. Okay? So we're doing two people again. This week, yeah, I split the question, so it's no big deal. Instead of 10 questions for one artist, it's a five each. Okay? All right, so let's uh, proceed. Go to the material. Okay, go to start the slideshow. And hit from the beginning, folks. Okay, so just to let you know, this is scheduled for April the 17th. Monday, April the 17th. I'm clicking this. There we go. School code. HUM 105, standing for Humanities, the Intimate Lives of the World's Most Famous Artists. You know, I start with a brief little background on each artist, no matter how famous, but it's just uh, their common, most famous works, and things like that. Uh, the course is what gets into the strange things about their lives that you don't know about or most people don't know about. So these uh, first parts are, are really going to be good, at least for Miss Papas, I mean, Cassatt. So most people don't know anything about her work at all. So as I say, without further ado, let's get going. Into the enjoyment we go. I didn't say week three. <clears throat> Again, the 17th. So here's a little background on Michelangelo. If you don't know anything about one of the world's most famous artists, uh, Michelangelo di Lodovico Bonarroti Simoni, that's his Italian name, was born March 6, 1475. So that makes him a little bit older than me and uh, died on February 18th. 1564, which is unbelievable at that time. Again, uh, medical was not as good. Cleanliness was not as good. Uh, standards of living, but uh, we're going to find out this person had a very strong body and was able to live much longer than the usual 40-something that most people passed away of during those times. Okay. Uh, yeah, looks like he was almost 90, 88, 89. So known as Michelangelo, was an Italian sculptor, painter, architect, and a poet of high Renaissance. So again, that was Imperial Europe, the Renaissance time. When Renaissance was supposed to be high point getting out of the mm, less educated, less worldly times and advancing into higher knowledge and art, science, you have it. Born in the Republic of Florence, which is in Italy, of course, his work was inspired by models with from classical antiquity. So he loved the old classics, the as to the Greek, ancient Greeks, Roman times, of course, and had a lasting influence on Western art. Yes, he influenced the West art for a long time, the United States included, and still does. Michelangelo's creative abilities, mastery in a range of artistic arenas, so that means different fields, Defined him as an 
archetypal Renaissance man. So let me go into another definition of Renaissance. Well, archetypal means like staple. When people talk about what's the staple food of uh, Asia, most countries except Mongolia will say, well, state that it's rice. Mexico, the staple food is corn, which is the core of the diet. So your typical and strong Renaissance man model was Michelangelo. And you say, well, what is a Renaissance man? Okay, well, a Renaissance man is a fellow that has many talents, not just one. If you look at the reading here, you know, many talents, sculptor, painter, architect, you will find he has others. So that's a Renaissance man. You're only have talent in one area, you were not considered a Renaissance man. All right, along with his rival, which means enemy, elder contemporary, which means older a fellow from the same time, contemporaries are from your same time, Leonardo da Vinci, who I think we talked about before, was his enemy and was older than him given the sheer volume of surviving correspondence. So sheer volume means like many, many copies of surviving correspondence, which means things written from each other or about each other, and then sketches and reminiscence. Michelangelo is one of the best documented artists of the 16th century. So if you remember, a lot of things got destroyed for Vinci, but not Michelangelo. All these different kinds of documentation prove how good of an or great an artist he was. He was lauded. Lauded is a high level form of respect, right? It's one thing to be respected. Like, yeah, that guy's respected, but lauded, ooh, that's the next level. He was lauded by contemporary biographers as the most accomplished artist area so there you go how how high of a respect is that when you have da vinci and other artists and contemporary biographers say this guy michelangelo was the best or number one or ichiban right so that's a little uh, background on him do we get a little more how about there's some yes because we've got to mention this work uh, Michelangelo achieved fame early. Two of his best known works, the Pietà and the David. So, again, if you want to tell somebody when they ask you, do you know any of Michelangelo's works? Again, we're not talking about the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? You say, oh, the Pietà or the David. Uh, there is a plaster. Sculpture in Forest Lawn, which is not too far from the school here. It's on the border of LA and Glendale. And if you just drive the Forest Lawn Cemetery, you will find a statue of David there. Take a picture with him. So those are his two most well known works. And they were sculpted before the age of 30. Although he did not consider himself a painter. So imagine that a person at such a high level painter and says, you know, I'm not really a painter. I don't consider myself a painter. It's pretty impressive. Michelangelo created two of the most influential frescoes, which is a style of art in the history of Western art. The scenes from Genesis, which comes from the Bible, on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. In Rome. And the Last Judgment on its altar wall. His design of the Laurentian Library pioneered mannerist architecture. That's a very important form of architecture. And it pioneered it or started it. And here we go. See these two? Before 30, at the age of 71, he's still doing the highest levels of art. He succeeded Antonio de Sampaio, the younger, as the architect of St. Peter's Basilica, which is the 
Let's face the silver cup of the world. Succeed it. Michelangelo transformed the plan so that the western end was finished, that is, of the basilica, to his design, as was the dome, which covers the building, with some modification after his death. Michelangelo was the first Western artist whose biography was published while he was alive. 99.9% .9 of your biographies are not published while people are alive. So that's another impressive stroke. In fact, three biographies were published during his lifetime. Three, one of them by Giorgio Vasari, proposed that Michelangelo's work transcended or went beyond that of any artist living or dead and was supreme in not one art alone, but in all three. Again, Renaissance man. In his lifetime, Michelangelo was often called Il Divino, the Divine One, which means touched by God. His contemporaries often admired his Heribilita, or translation is his ability to instill a sense of awe in the viewers of his art. If you're not familiar with this word here, I'm underlining awe. I'll give you a definition of awe. So it says his work was able to make people feel this upon viewing his work. That's how good it is. So on a natural level, many, many people go to the Grand Canyon. And they look at the Grand Canyon. And they feel awe if they realize that this was completely done by nature over millions of years. And you sit there and think, how did this happen? You know, or the same can be said if you go to Niagara Falls. Again, you feel awe looking at that construction of nature. Uh, I myself can tell you that when I went to China and I stood before the Great Wall of China and actually climbed it, uh, I felt awe because, again, it's just an unbelievable sculpture. Well, not sculpture, but architectural work, and no modern tools were used. How did they do it? And how did they put it in that mountain as it curves with the mountain? So, in that sense, I felt awe as I looked at that. So, again, his artwork made, they see it, okay, bingo, here's his artwork, and they just go, wow. So, awe is when your jaw drops open, hits the floor, right? So, the middle here, Michelangelo was the first Western artist who was by, oh, sorry, past that. Okay, here's the last part. In his lifetime, Angelo was off, oh, I get that too. Ah, here we go. I get so wrapped up in the awe. Attempts by subsequent or following artists to imitate him and the expressive physicality of Michelangelo's style contributed to the rise of mannerism. There's mannerism again. A short-lived movement in Western art following the high renaissance. Okay. Okay, so now let's get into the strange things of his life should in this course okay so there he is this is the david so this is what you look for in forest lawn cemetery again it's on the border of glendale and los angeles and, uh, it's free and open to the public and you can drive up there and people take pictures with it especially ladies i don't know why because it's a nude man i have no idea So the other things you can see here is him working in the basilica with the dome, what have you. Other designs that he made. Here's the snake that referring to medical or the, the dawn of man. Working with a candle on top of his head. And as you see, 
Let's see. Hold on. Oh, almost did it. Okay. He looks very strong, like Gerald Butler from, you know, that Spartan movie with 300. So, and he was a very strong man. Let's find that out. Okay, so it says here, see, like the drawing says, candles on his head. Michelangelo Buonarroti, born in Caprese, Italy, now they're actually in the city of town. 1475, died in Rome. Okay. Brief synopsis here. Influential Italian sculptor, painter, considered by some the greatest artist who ever lived, especially famous for the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. An impressive feat, my friend. And he says, I have known every shame suffered. So I guess he's trying to tell you this. Committed a lot of sins, done many bad things. And also he said he suffered every hardship. So it means he struggled with many different life problems. And known as the divine, divino, Michelangelo once wrote. So again, remember it said they have many of his writings, manuscripts. During his long, mostly lonely life, he made few friends and numerous enemies. So many more enemies than friends that might talk about his personality. And especially too Made a lot of enemies, mostly lonely. Mm. But they say a lot of geniuses are not easy to understand. And they have a hard time understanding regular folks. So, right. Let's see. With his strong personality and forceful speech, well, there you go. Once you have a strong personality, say like a Trump, don't make a lot of friends forceful speech, Michelangelo created an impression of messiness, which if you don't know messiness, like, oh, that table is messy. Let's just say it has, okay, it's a table. You haven't cleaned the plates. You haven't cleaned the silverware. Or maybe there's food on the plate. You haven't cleaned the napkins. There's magazines on there. It's very messy. So it doesn't mean necessarily dirty. I mean, you can easily just pick those things up and the table's fine. Uh, but he lived a messy lifestyle. Uh, fierce pride, so very strong pride. Probably not a person that's going to say, I'm sorry. And then gloom. If you don't know gloom, gloom is like a sadness that doesn't go away quickly can't be sad, but it's kind of like for a very short time. So says, hey, let's go have some beers. And then they stop being sad, right? Or some TV show comes on and they're happy for the next 30 minutes, right? But gloom, you know, that's like a sadness that lasts days. So messiness, fierce pride, gloom. Legendary for doing battle with anyone he disagreed with. So he fought with anybody who disagreed with him. Again, not a recipe for making friends. You know, I'm sure he disagreed on the smallest of things. He was the first to describe himself as mad, which is the old word for crazy, and wicked. Wicked is an old form for evil. So, like I said, he committed many sins, and he said, I'm wicked for that, and I lose my temper, and I do crazy stuff, so I'm mad. And that's how he described himself. He could insult a fellow artist to the point where he would get sued for libel, and then fortunately lose. So uh, these are legal terms. So you, libel is when you accuse someone of something that is not true, 
right? Let's say, uh, you know, you, you, you have a friend, he opens a fried chicken restaurant, and then you just insult him, and then you, you, you tell the news media, hey, he stole KFC's recipe. And then they go to court, and then, you know, you find out that it's not true. So, like I said, he just argued for argument's sake, even though he knew he was going to lose. Uh, the broken nose and his famous profile resulted from a fist fight with a rival sculptor. So here's a, another sculptor, and instead of respecting the person's work or admiring it, got into a fist fight, and he got his nose broken. So I guess the other guy was tough as well. His rivalry with Leonardo, which is already stated, Da Vinci was especially intense or strong. And he taunted, which means teased, the older man in public. He once got even with a critic by painting him into a picture smothered by a boiled snake. So, right, he says, oh, friend, I'm going to paint you. I say, oh, my God, Michelangelo's going to paint you. But then it looks like you're being eaten by a snake. So, not fun. That's how he got his revenge because the guy criticized him. Another time, a duke who resented Michelangelo's defendant spirit would have had him killed if the Pope had intervened. So, you see, you don't have. Dukes, uh, we're not governed by the Pope here in the States. So, okay, we'll use a political person. Uh, who's the mayor of L.A.? Uh, Garcetti, right? And uh, uh, well, I don't know if Garcetti can have anybody killed, but let's say he was going to put him in prison for the rest of his life. But Biden, the president, you know, intervened and said, no, you can't do that. So that's how mad he could get people, and unfortunately also people that had power. Michelangelo also had a stormy, which is like a fighting, violent relationship with his father, whose violent disapproval he had to overcome in order to study art. Yet Michelangelo was always loyal, once writing to him, all the troubles I have borne, I have borne out of affection for you. So, what this shows is that even though he was mistreated by his father, and his father did not approve of his study of art, he this is kind of like a admiration for his father. He said, all the troubles I have borne, I have borne out of affection for you. So I guess it's trying to say, I was trying to prove myself to you, father, even though you don't accept me and you treat me badly. So it looks like other people he could get tough with. I mean, it did have a strong relationship, but that looks, sounds like the beginning. But I guess he actually cared for his father and wanted him wanted uh, his father's respect. During his life, he made great sacrifices to help his father and four brothers. His mother died young. Okay, so that's probably another case of he didn't get the mother's side in his upbringing and her love and care. Had a rough personality because his father was rough with him from day one. No balance in his upbringing. Michelangelo's love for stone, he often said, came from a stone cutter's wife who had nursed him when he was a baby. So, see, mother died when he was young. Stone cutter's wife nursed him and took care of him as a baby. And from this, he had a love of stone. And as we 
continue, his favorite material to work with was expensive marble. Not cheap marble. Expensive. And he was at the mercy of wealthy patrons who could afford it. So that means if he had rich clients who could afford expensive marble, he was he couldn't control himself. He had to take the job because he loved to he couldn't buy it himself, so he loved to work with expensive marble. But he could work with anything and once upon request. So that means he had the talent to work with. I mean, Concrete, I know, you name it, he could work with it, right? Wow. But upon request, created what may have been the world's most magnificent snowman. Interesting. So he even worked with snow. I didn't know. Most people don't know this. But not to be created as one of his top works, right? But look at the way they describe it. World's most magnificent snow. Eventually, he became wealthy, but he always acted as if he weren't. This is not new, again, with people from all walks of life. Uh, I have grown up learning about people from, again, all races that became wealthy for whatever reason, but decided to live very poorly. Fascinating subject. Obviously, you know, I talked about Kim Kardashian last week and a lot of other, you know, Mike Tyson went by and rubbed. What's the first the big rapper? I can't remember. MC Hammer, another guy with, they asked him, you know, because he became bankrupt. And he said, what would you do different? Because I think he made like 40 million in his life for his young career. He said, well, I wouldn't get a 40 room mansion. I wouldn't have a number of private jets, wouldn't have 16 Rolls Royces. Okay, so that's the other end of the spectrum. During his last 30 years, he lived in a small, dark house in an alley. Now, what wealthy man would live like that? It was decorated with cobwebs. Uh, cobwebs are the things that spiders make that you see in the corner, uh, the corners in your house, and then they hang from the cobweb and try to eat flies from there. That's their house. So it's covered with cobwebs. They must have a lot of spiders there. And his drawing of a man carrying a coffin. So all these works of beauty, David and the Pieta, that he created for society, yet in his home, he has a drawing of a man carrying a coffin representing death. Very interesting on his psychology. He seldom bathed, so very rarely took a bath. Or even took off his dog skin boots. I didn't know they made boots from dogs at that time. So if he seldom bathed, he probably had a nice body aroma. You know? When he did remove them, sometimes bits of his feet came off too. Uh-oh. As he didn't believe in buying socks. Okay. So if you wear some kind of leather that sticks to your skin and you don't take off your shoes for said seldom, so I don't know, let's say weeks, a month, whatever, and they stick to your skin over that time, no socks. When you take off your, let's say after a month or two months, you take off your dog skin boots, it's going to peel skin. Skin's just going to come off because it's stuck to the leather of the sweaty dog boot. Uh, I guess even the paint didn't bother. When he did remove, okay, he wore black quilted jackets and broad rim felt hats. So I guess out in public he dressed very nicely, but at home, 
where he spent a lot of time he dressed or looked like a homeless person. He ate crust of bread while he worked. So crust, if you don't know what a crust of bread is, it's like, like let's say kids, a lot of kids, you give them a slice of bread, they will eat the whole white part and leave the outside brown lining. Those are the crust. So I guess maybe when he first got the bread fresh, he ate the white part and then he let the outside get hard like croutons and then he ate them later. And at night when he couldn't sleep, he put a device on his head that held a candle. That's why we have the drawing with the lit candle on his forehead made of goat grease. So grease from a dead goat. Again, why? Because it burned. Um, no electricity at that time, which dripped less than wax. So if you have regular wax from a regular candle, it drips a lot. Um, He's making me think of, I don't know, I, I still, remember Boy George? Well, I, they showed him, I remember seeing him like 10 years ago, and he hadn't done anything for a while. And his new fashion was he had a melted purple candle on the top of his head. He, you know, he was bald, so uh, and then he had like white makeup on his face. And that candle dripped all over his forehead, so... I guess a candle made of goat grease doesn't drip as much, which is important when you're trying to create art. Uh, created weird shadows that must have perplexed the neighbors, but shed enough light for him to work by. See, that was important for him to be able to see, to work, paint. Uh, so when it says it created weird shadows, so the thing on top of his head, if you were a neighbor, so the light makes a shadow in the window with a curtain. And you're a neighbor, you look across the way, and it's like, is that a man with a horn on his head or some kind of creature? And perplexed is a high-level word for confused. So just, I don't know, say you were a new neighbor across the street and you looked at night and you saw this weird shadow with like a horn, but was it a fire or whatever? What is going on? So someone said, oh, that's that uh, crazy guy, Michelangelo. Got a candle on today. Uh, Michelangelo could be generous in helping younger artists. That's nice. But he had few real friends until he made time for them late in life. So a lot of artists, they're so busy creating and learning and doing what they love to do that they don't make time to have real friends. But later in life, it said he did. I can remember the comedian Jerry Seinfeld. I just saw him interviewed the other day and talks about his uh, start of his career as a teenager all the way. I don't think he got it shown until he was 30. So all his 20s, he said, I, my career was the most important thing for me. So I didn't make time in, for friendships and people were easily expendable to not until later he got successful, not to be a multimillionaire that he had the time to say, hey, I want to cultivate good friendships. Uh, one was a young Roman nobleman, became a friend of his, Tommaso di Cavalieri. The other was a noble woman and poet, Vittoria Colonna, whom he greatly respected. So that's another thing. When you get older, you can really start appreciating other things and people and respecting them. You're a young hothead, you want to prove that you're the number one in the world. There's not a lot of respect for other folks trying to do the best. He loved to have long conversations with her in the garden, sitting against her ivy covered wall. Ivy is a plant, they cover walls usually. Because of his passion for the male form, or male body, that's why we have the David, he used male models even for the women in his art. That's really interesting. I don't understand because a woman's body shape is different. 
So I don't, I don't see how he could, let's say, because I got David was nude. So let's say he has a nude woman, but yet he's going to do a painting or a sculpture of a man. I, I, I'm not an artist, but I think that would confuse me. That's kind of like, uh, to me saying, okay, I want to paint an apple, but my model is an orange. I, I don't, but I guess it works for him because he loved the male form so much. So because of this, people assume or thought that Michelangelo was homosexual. But then you see, doesn't say anything about that after, so I guess they're trying to say he wasn't, right? Michelangelo remained lean, which is very thin and strong, even in his old age, where most everybody gains the weight and the metabolism slows down. Hard to get the weight off. He could split blocks of marble with a single strike of his mallet. I don't know if you know how hard marble is, but like I could probably hit marble and it won't split. And with just, I probably have to hit it many times. Uh, but he could do it with one strike, even as he got to be a senior citizen. Now it is like a thick hammer. So he still retained his strength. He rode horseback in the country every day, whatever the weather. That means rain or shine. He worked right up to the then unusual age of 88. Like I said, looks like he lived to be 88 or 89. I guess he died right before his 89th birthday. So he was riding a horse in the rain at 88. Right now, most people have a hard time walking. And he caught a fever after riding in the rain. Died a few days later. So it's like a lot of Older folks at that age that catch pneumonia, they do not recover. Maybe if they had had modern medicine at that time, he could have recovered because he was a strong guy, but he lived alone, so I don't think anybody took care of him, you know? So, uh, again, but he did live to be which is quite fascinating for his time, okay? So that's a peek into Michelangelo's life personality. So here's a lady I chose to accompany him. Oh, I got to do the artwork first. So at the age of 23, remember they said before, 30, Michelangelo finished a sculpture called the Pieta. After delivering himself in a handcart, he overheard an odd, there's odd again, spectators said Michelangelo was too young to have created the work. They didn't believe it. Angry that night he returned and chiseled his name on it. The Pieta is the only work he ever signed. Somebody pissed him off and said, this can't be you. You're too young. Michelangelo once fought with Leonardo as da Vinci over a block of marble that had been stored for years in a cathedral workyard. Michelangelo won and worked on his new sculpture for almost three years. The marble chips piling high as he chiseled away. The result was David, the biblical hero, and the work that made Michelangelo world famous. I told you guys what is the end. Lastly, one of the wonders of the art world was created under what may have been the worst working condition. While painting the enormous ceiling of the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican in Rome, Michelangelo developed numerous ailments from spending more than four years, 60 feet in the air, a ladder and pulley, hit back, paint splattering his face. I understand it also got into his eyes. Now, as many as 7,000 tourists come every day craning or arching their necks to see Michelangelo see. That's how much it meant. It was not good for his health. Okay. But now we move on to the lady I chose. Hardly anybody knows about this lady, so it should be fun. You should know about her. Mary Cassatt, Mary Stevenson Cassatt, born May 22nd, 1844, and died June 14, 1926, was an American painter and printmaker. She was born in Allegheny, Pennsylvania, 
now part of Pittsburgh's north side, but lived much of her adult life in France. She befriended Edgar Degas and exhibited with the impression that Edgar Degas was a famous French painter known for the Impressionist era. Assad often created images of the social and private lives of women with particular emphasis on the intimate bonds between mothers and children. Good stuff, something that a lot of, not a lot of people were talking about at the time. She was described by Gustave Pierforoy as one of Le Trois Grandes Dames, one of the three great ladies of Impressionism, another art form, alongside uh, Marie Braquemont and Berthe Morisot. In 1879, Diego Martelli compared her to Vega, which was her idol, as they both sought to depict or show movement, light, and design in the most modern sense in their painting. You know, I talked about last week the light. How do you also paint that shows maybe movement with light and design? Wow. Okay, so let's get into her life. There she is. Looks like some kitties, doggy, horse. Right, there's her bonnet with the flowers. She did a lot of things, or most of her, her scope was on women, so that's why we got flowers. Okay. Riding a tall horse, Marie Cassatt, born in Allegheny City, Pennsylvania, 1945, died in Menso, de Rebois, France, 1926. So she also lived a long life, 23 years. A renowned, very well known, famous American painter whose favorite subjects were motherhood and childhood. Mary Cassatt valued her independence all her life. Valued it. Don't forget that. Anxious to escape prim and proper Philadelphia society, so prim and proper is high society. Kind of living, she moved to Paris, the European capital of art, just as soon as she could. As a painter, she was a woman in a man's world. Because of her love of all things French, she became an American in France, which was quite a unique situation at the time. When Cassatt announced her intentions to be an artist, her father is supposed to have said, I would almost rather see dead. Now, I don't know how she back from that. I'm guessing she was very close to her father, wanted her father to support her goal, but for someone to tell you that they would rather see dead, that's your father saying that. Uh, most people would have been crushed. She's a very strong woman. Her family's idea of a good work of art was one with horses in it, and they weren't especially interested in what Marne Assad's family nicknamed. Or if it's in the United States, they would call her Marnie, did. But they didn't stand in her way, so that means they didn't prevent her. And indeed, were almost always around, so that's good. They didn't prevent her or kick her out of the family. They just said your decision was garbage. Uh, in part to act as chaperones, which uh, society required for unmarried women. Okay, so let me give you uh, updated definition for chaperone. Okay. I guess when I was a teenager. This chaperone thing was dying out, but it could still happen. So what I'm trying to say is, that you're gonna laugh. 
not going to believe it. Let's see. Number 18. We'll have a date. With a girl that's 17. But in my time, it was ending, but I still saw it. The parents did not trust the 18 year old guy with the 17 year old girl. So they sent usually a happy auntie. And she was the chaperone. So she also went on the date, which made it very uncomfortable, very unfun. But she had to make sure that the young man was not greasy and going to try to take advantage. I don't, cannot believe things like that happened. But uh, they did. Kazat's reaction to meeting French artist Edgar Degas was to write later, I began to live. That was her requirement. Luckily, she had a good meeting with her idol. A lot of people do not. They always say, do not. It's better for you not to meet your idols because they will disappoint you. But this was not the case with Edgar Degas. And uh, her life just got so hopeful at that point. He called her a supplier of good days for himself. So I guess somehow she had a sunny personality around him and made him very happy. She called him my best, my only friend. Uh, so I would say, are you sure these two weren't dating? What's going on here? Let me get here. People assumed that there was a romance between Kassad and Dega, right? I would too. But the truth will never be known. Uh oh, it's a mystery. So maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, but they're not going to tell. Maybe it was a secret, or there are people that just. They'll tell you, you know, people will say, ah, I bet a million dollars those two had a relationship. And you find out oddly, they were just like brother and sister and the friendship was deep. It's not the case. Okay? It's kind of hard to believe in today's day and time. Though. She burned all of his letters before she died. That's a very strange thing. And none of hers to him have ever come to light. So as I read, this now, if they let, let's say we'll take the assumption that they were just like brother and sister, there was absolutely no uh, relationship other than a deep friendship. They probably wouldn't have burned the letters, she wouldn't have burned the letters, and I guess he destroyed hers. But if you're hiding a love affair, then of course, you don't want any evidence. So I guess now I would think they had a relationship. Okay, and then we have a funny thing here. Too much pudding. Hassan said about the increasing praise for her work as if fame was too sweet for her. So where, say, many people start getting famous and start getting receiving many awards uh, some of them, uh, you know, it gives them a big ego. So they'll say, I won this award and I won that award and I was an artist of the year. And then later I had the best single and I had, a, you know, the number one single. Then I had the best album, whatever. But as she got more and more famous, she was like, it's too much praise, too much pudding. You know, the fame was too, too sweet for her. That's not what she was after in life. But she did relish or really love ordering fancy clothes from the best shops. So it's the money she got from her. She was able to utilize that to make herself very happy. So that's why we have in the picture, uh, the drawing of her with the elaborate hat or bonnet with the flowers. She bought large elaborate hats, simple but elegant dresses, often in gray. So she loved to dress in a nice way, in a certain way. Eventually with her earnings, the money that she gained, she purchased a red brick home in the country called Chateau de Boufresne, House of the Beautiful Ash Tree. 
that's the translation from the French. There she would entertain them over for cups of tea or lunch or dinner, I'm not sure, or booze, I don't know. Entertain writers, diplomats, and painters until 2 a.m. And then somehow be at work the next morning wearing her white crepe smock. She ate oysters for lunch, so expensive and rich food. For dessert, she liked chocolate caramel sweets. Or perhaps a Philadelphia treat known as white mountain cake. I'm not from Philadelphia. I've never heard of this, but maybe I'll ask somebody I know from Philadelphia. The neighbor's view of Passat was often that of a woman leaning down from a tall horse. So like Michelangelo's neighbor's uh, view of Michelangelo was a strange shadow of a large man with a horn or something on his head. The people often saw her leaning down from tall horses. Horses were her passion, her means of escape and source of exercise. Their danger and speed appealed to her. They enabled her to be close to her father with whom she frequently rode. So I guess he became accustomed because of the money of her artistic life. They got closer and they stayed. Since the parents loved horses. Uh, she frequently rode with her father. At age 43, she was seriously injured when a snake bit her horse and the animal threw her. So she must have gotten injured in some way maybe broke her back or vertebrae or legs, I don't know. This didn't stop her from riding. So whatever the injuries were, she got back up and rode. That's a brave lady. But she began dividing her interests between horses and Belgian griffons. That's why I have a little doggies on the bottom of the drawing. A breed of dog that always looks as if it might nip. So little dogs, no, big dogs were worried about their bite. Uh, little dogs have tiny little teeth, so when they bite you, we call it a nip, right? You'll survive a nip, but if a big German Shepherd bites you. I don't know, it depends where it bites you, but little nips, you know. Cassac would seem a little nippish herself. Interesting, I don't know if she bit anybody. If she disagreed with her dinner guest, she would bang her fist on the table. So, oh, she didn't like disagreeing either, just like Michelangelo. I don't know why she would get so angry that she would have to pound on the table with her fist, but there you go. Although she was famous for her drawings of children, Passat had no desire to be a wife or mother. Isn't that interesting? I remember one time I taught English to children uh, there was a colleague of mine, and uh, I guess she was married. I asked her if she had any kids. She said no. And I wondered, because she was definitely not in her 20s anymore, I asked her how come she didn't have any kids. She said, I hate children. So why she was teaching kids, she hated children, I don't know. Okay. So back to Cassat, her only known romantic relationship came late in her life, with at least a known one, right? With a banker who shopped at Tiffany's for jeweled collars and feeding bowls for her Pekingese, which is a little dog named Batty. She just had to have these tiny little nippers, right? She hated being called a woman artist instead of just an artist. And she supported the right of women to vote. So I guess in a way she was a feminist or at least supported feminist causes. She gave generous financial help to see women factory workers. And she looked forward to a future in which women would take part in government. So yes, she truly supported ladies. And I guess fell in love, but they children. 
maybe the sternness of her father and his you know, bad comments. She thought, I don't want to have children. Who knows? Uh, finishing up here late in life, Kassat went blind and so had to stop pain. Doesn't say why she went blind. Poor thing. She died at 81. Okay. Again, not a common age. If you look, she died at the turn of 19, 1926. A lot of people were still not living at 81. I think the median age here now in the United States is only 70 something, early 70s. Alone except for her faithful housekeeper, Matilde. So she was alone. Uh, Michelangelo did not have a housekeeper, but she did. And all oh, three other servants. Pierre Fresnay was eventually turned into a home for abandoned children. I guess she probably put that in her will. Like when I die, please make my home uh, a home for abandoned children. Very kind. Uh, woman. Artworks. Kassad once painted a portrait of a family friend who rejected the work because of the nose. The friend thought it looked a bit like a pig's snout. So imagine you have her paint a painting of you, but your nose looks like a pig's nose. Uh, upset, Kassad struck the painting in a storeroom for more than 20 years and didn't pick up a brush for months. That's how insulted she was. Known as Lady at the Tea Table, it now hangs in the museum. So if I was you, get on Google and hit Lady at the Tea Table. You decide yourself if uh, the woman in the painting, her nose looks like a pig's nose. A Good Night Hug is another one of her works. Kassad's first mother and child work was painted three years after she met Degas. He had advised her that the maternal theme which had never been done except in a religious way, would set her apart and compensate for the lack of recognition she would face as a woman painter. So I guess there was some woman painters at the time, but people did not respect them or fully support them. But he said uh, her art will endure. Lastly, the first of many pictures of her favorite niece was Ellen Mary Cassatt. That was her favorite piece for which the infant posed without complaint. And so I guess they're saying the baby did not cry. Most children found posing to facade an agreeable experience as she supplied chocolates, books, and toys. Well, that's one way to keep them quiet. Give them chocolates and toys that are about books and they will make a fuss. Some, however, were made nervous by her crowd of nipping Griffon. So... I guess she left her little baby doggies running around instead of keeping them in another room. And some of these doggies maybe tried nipping at her kids and made them nervous. So there you go. She had to have her baby uh, doggies with her. On to the questions. Michelangelo. Question one with his strong personality. Forceful speech, Michelangelo created what? So this question is about his personality. Don't get fooled in thinking it's about his artwork. His personality and speech did not create art, but this, again, we talk about his personality. Two, how did Michelangelo describe himself? Did he say, I'm the most handsome man in the world or the most intelligent? What did he say about himself? Three, what was his favorite material to work with? Was it sand or gold or diamonds? Or what was his final home decorated with? Plants, shag carpet? Five, how did Michelangelo die? Was he attacked by a bear? Did he die from a poisonous kiss from a beautiful woman? How did he die? Okay. Let's proceed on to Mary Cassatt. When Mary Cassatt told her parents that she wanted to be an artist, what did her father tell her? Oh, thank God, daughter. I love you so much. I want you to be an artist. Is that what he said? Look it up. 
seven, what kinds of people that Mary entertained at her home? Were they rappers, ballers, boxers, break dancers, skateboarders? What kind of people were they? Eight, what did horses mean to her? How important were horses in her life? That's what that question is. Nine, what did she hate being called? An old woman? An ugly woman? A fat woman? What did she hate being called? You know, I'm tricky. Ten, what happened to her late in life? Did she get married? Did she have a baby? Did she declare bankruptcy? What happened to her late in life? I think that ends it, folks. Did that see? There we go. Oh, my gosh. Stop sharing. Here we go. So we're done with those two. We did enough time. We had enough questions. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Again, this lesson is for April the 17th. And uh, I shall see you next week with another lesson. So everybody, uh, please take care.